now that now that our in-flight video is done, please return your seat backs and tray tables to the upright position because there's going to be some turbulence here. All right, so let's think about this. Uh, everything in the universe that lives eats. Uh, everything that eats tastes. So uh, this is not my quote. This is a quote from a very brilliant man, a uh, lawman of the 18th century turned major foodie, maybe the world's first big foodie. Uh, I'm talking about jean Antelm Briat Savarin, a very quotable guy and pretty brilliant. He basically wrote a book uh, that broke down his existence into what was important for him, food and flavor. That book is called The Physiology of Taste. So this guy had a pretty cool idea. Um, and it, it was the first cookbook or culinary book that I read, and it just sort of stuck with me. Flavor and taste defines your food chain. Everything you eat is because it is palatable. Imagine going into a restaurant or a grocery store and buying a bunch of stuff that tastes terrible. Wouldn't happen. They wouldn't stay in business. That would not be sustainable. So by that rationale, um, we're going to step into the Pandora's box of food. And what I want you to do is open up this box right here. So in order to get what we're talking about, you have to experience it. Otherwise, we're just going to sound nuts. Um, the first thing that you're going to see, uh, this is a lemon, your standard garden variety, organic, all-natural lemon. Um, here we have some printed food, again, organic and natural. Um, this right here, these are pipettes used in genetic testing. This is just to squirt down your gullet. So it has coffee. And then this right here is an edible packaging peanut. We made these out of corn, and uh, you can use them for packaging, but we're not going to tap into that right now. Uh, they taste like something. I can't tell you yet. And then here, this is a Miracle Berry tablet. Ingrain that into your brain right now because you're never going to forget it. This is the result of six years of hard work, and we're making public disclosure for the first time today. So um, that being said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to make great food. We'll come right back to this. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and start eating some of the items in that box. There's two of everything, so right now you can go ahead and eat one of everything, and uh, it's all going to make sense. Oh, it's not going to taste good, by the way. It's probably going to be kind of gross. It's going to be um, nasty. Yeah. Remember that flavor, nasty. But that, that offers up a great question. What does it take to make good food? Uh, you know, we get asked this all the time as chefs. Um, you know, how do you make a great restaurant quality dish? And the answer is pretty simple. It takes three main components. Uh, the first one's obvious. You've got to have quality products. So a good ingredient, you know, you can't make a tasty tomato sauce without a tasty tomato. That's just crazy. Uh, the second is proper execution of technique. So the way that you prepare these quality ingredients that translates into said tasty tomato sauce. Uh, the third, in our opinion, is the most important and all, uh, also the most overlooked, and that is one's ability to transform a flavor or be able to alter somebody else's perception of that flavor. Hmm. So at this point, uh, the transformation of flavor is the most important thing in, in our, our food society, our, our food genre. And so what we're going to do is take that little red pill. You've heard of the blue pill, the red pill? Today you're going to eat the red pill. Um, it's actually a tablet. There are two ingredients in that tablet, one being Miracle Berries, which are all organic and natural, uh, and the other one is cornstarch to compress it together. So you're going to suck on that like a cough drop. I'm going to talk a little bit about Miracle Berries and where these things came from. They were discovered in 1725 by a French explorer who went over to West Africa, and he was studying plant life. In 1725, he discovered a tribe that had the ability to basically eat wild vegetation around them as well as what they were farming. And they would take a lot of these products and make them uh, into fermented products or let them rot, essentially. So this tribe was eating everything from what we perceive as food to things that we would never even think of as food, meaning eh, switchgrass, hay, leaves, stuff that would just fall to the ground. This was fascinating to me. I started wondering. Why were they eating the red berry? What was going on here? So the explorer uh, described in his notes that this tribe was eating this strange little red berry, then eating all of this other stuff. They had addiction of food that we can't even imagine. 
they were the only tribe in West Africa at the time that did not have a famine problem. And this is back in 1725. This offers up another great question. What does a tribe in West Africa and some French dude have to do with us? Well, they're kind of all points on a timeline that have led up to what we do now. Uh, meaning applications. What are applications that we can do today with this uh, Miracle Berry product? Well, we've kind of broken it down into four main applications. The first one is the obvious one, culinary. Uh, so, you know, the effects of this berry on your tongue, it's, it's a way for you to taste food that you're familiar with for the first time, uh, to re-engage yourself with a familiar food product. Um, it's really exciting and it's, it's fun to do. There's, there is kind of a novelty factor, um, but application number two is much less novel, but far more applicable. Uh, when, when somebody with cancer is going through chemotherapy, a lot of times, in most cases, what happens is they lose certain sensations in their tongue that change the flavors that they can experience. So in almost all cases, this leads to them tasting only things that are metallic and rubbery. And that sounds pretty gross. And so what happens is uh, this results in a decrease of appetite. They stop eating. Their bodies become weak. And you, you see where this goes. So what we did is we actually developed these little strips, these dissolvable strips that one of these patients would put on their tongue. And uh, with the help of some very generous volunteers, you know, people that are actually living through uh, fighting cancer, we found that in every single case that we've tried, that they've you know, tried the strip, they're able to at least taste different flavors and uh, their appetites returned, and they were able to you know, carry on their battle with cancer. So why is this happening? What's going on? Your taste buds have two little nerve endings. One of them tastes sour and bitter things. The other one tastes everything else. This berry has an all-natural glycoprotein in it that's going to attach itself. It's attaching itself to the sour receptor right now. So the reason why we include a lemon is that when you taste that lemon, it's going to taste like lemonade. So we, in effect, have made refined sugar obsolete, which we'll try in just a minute. So other applications for this, eliminating refined sugar, basically diets. If we can eliminate the need for refined sugar, the negative environmental impact of refined sugar, we would uh, eradicate diabetes, lower health insurance rates, uh, lower heart attacks, increase quality of life. That sounds like a pretty good deal. And the other application which we tapped into is famine. How are we going to find a magic bullet for famine? What's that going to take? We're still talking about vertical farms in the first world. The third world is ripe and primed and has already proven that this works. So with that, we're going to move on to some other examples of food replication flavor transformation, and why it is relevant to what we're discussing. This is something that we served at Moto Restaurant. This is basically something that looks and tastes like a monkey roll. When we opened this place, we just wanted to do something that was outside of the box and really cool, and more or less just entertain ourselves. Um, but a lot of people thought that we were a Japanese seafood restaurant. So they kept asking us, why don't you serve sushi rolls? Why don't you serve maki rolls? So I got really fed up with this, and I said, all right, here's your maki rolls. People would come in, they sit down, give them some chopsticks and that piece of paper. Some people would walk out, some people were like, wow, what else you got? Here's what we had. Right when they sat down, they would get their edible menu. This menu in particular tastes like a margarita with chips and salsa. Every month in the United States, 20 tons of paper are wasted in restaurants alone. If everybody ate their menu, we would have a bigger decrease, a much more sustainable way to use paper. Um, and that's not the only application for this. When we served these products to cancer patients, they voluntarily took this. It came in the form of edible paper. They pop it on their tongue. There's no chewing. If somebody is physically ill, can't really chew their food, boom, it's a great medium to deliver things. Are you talking about printed food? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, printed food, that's, uh, that, that was one step along the path that got us to this point. Another one would be food replication. So you guys know what that is, right? Nachos. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually, sorry, X, uh, this is a dessert. So fla uh, uh, food replication, what does it mean? We're taking ingredients from one geographic location and changing the texture, changing the appearance of those ingredients to mimic 
an actual dish from the same region. This is, in our minds, how to serve a crazy looking plate of food and have it make sense. Um, and the, the interesting thing that happens here is that you don't actually know it's a dessert until you begin eating it, until you experience the flavors, and you're like, oh my god, what's going on here? Uh, but it's, it's, it all has to do with the relationship between your tongue and your brain. Um, you know, when you see something, when you see a tomato, you're like, oh, I know what that's going to taste like. It's going to taste like a tomato. But uh, what if it doesn't? What if it tastes like raspberry? <clears throat> uh, Cuban cigar. Everyone, you know, everyone associates this with, like, you know, the fine life, the finer things in life. Uh, is this really a Cuban cigar? <gasps> no, it's not. This is a Cuban pork sandwich. So, again, you can see food replication. We're taking the idea of a Cuban cigar we're taking a Cuban pork sandwich, these two things from the same place, taking it apart, putting it back together in a way that looks very different uh, so as to trick your brain. And that wrapper in no way, shape, or form is in any way resembling a Cohiba cigar. Right. Um, hey, let's go back to your boxes real quick. So now that the Miracle Berry has had its chance to like do its thing on your tongue, um, go ahead and retaste everything in your box. So now you just raise your hands if you think that's crazy. Is that crazy? Yeah. So now that's that lemon is going to be sweet and taste more like lemonade. Uh, that coffee is going to taste like it's been sweetened with sugar. Um, that little piece of paper, instead of tasting like paper, is going to taste more like, uh, think, pound cake with mixed berries. And that, uh, that lovely edible packaging material is going to taste more like candy corn or like kettle corn. Um, so this, uh, this takes us into a, a new dimension with food. Um, so we've mentioned future food in the past. Uh, it's a TV show that we made at the restaurant where we basically have license to come up with these crazy ideas, uh, take it around different places in Chicago, and share them with the general public. Here's one. Uh, this is something that we made as a reaction to Dwindling, uh, dwindling food supplies in the ocean, you know, overfishing, things of that nature. So we're actually turning local organic produce into uh, something very comparable to uh, foreign seafood. So instead of ordering fish from you know, 10,000 miles away, uh, you can actually grow watermelons, compress them, take the sweetness out, uh, flavor them slightly, freeze them in liquid nitrogen, roll them in sesame seeds to create the effect texturally, visually, and uh, on your tongue of a seared tuna loin. Even with the industrialized process of taking liquid nitrogen and freezing it, it in the end costs less than going getting tuna. But check this out. That's a burger patty. Okay, what does a cow eat? Cow eats beets, barley, and corn. So we basically took that, took the cow out of the equation, and then made that into the burger patty and you can see it's got all the characteristics. You got a little marbling in there. It, the juices, it's simmering in its own juices, getting that caramelization. Uh. If it looks and tastes like a burger patty, but there's no burger meat in it, who cares? That's what we got. <laughs> hey, it's Grandma's house. Now, actually, uh, this, whoever lives in this, in this hidden shack, uh, their understanding about living with permaculture. So they're taking advantage of the things that grow wildly around them. Pretty smart. Uh, how does this relate to us? Well, we, we did a dinner for a select group of lucky diners, I guess, where we created a five-course menu of nothing but locally harvested. Um, when I say that, I mean like we got in Omar's car and drove around and picked a lot of stuff out of the ground. My backyard. Uh, wild vegetation. So like we're cooking trees or you know tree bark, uh, leaves, grass, shrubs, basically the stuff that you see when you leave your house on the way to the car to go to work. That's what we made this five-course dinner out of. And actually, Yummy. halfway through the dinner, one guy, he's like, man, I get it. Like, you guys are talking about ending world hunger. I get it. I see where you're going. This, this could happen. So literally, you're in this restaurant. These guys are paying, I don't know, 150 bucks a head. And we feed them these courses, and they have no idea. Sorry, Ted. Um, so they literally are eating these courses thinking that this is fine dining. And... I'm paying good money for this. Then, at the end of their meal, we wheel out this cart that's got, like, hay and, you know, just uh, stuff growing on the sidewalk. And they're like, what the hell is that? And we're like, that's what you just ate. <laughs> and they couldn't believe it, all because of tricking their taste buds. Because now they have a new idea as to what food is, where it's going. Hyper-localization, walking out your front door, offsetting food miles and everything with just what grows wild. Why not?
Tastes good, good for you. Here we have another innovation. This is carbonated fruit. So what we did is we took some uh, grapes and we put them into a balloon. And then we blew up the balloon. You breathe out carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide would go into the water molecules in the grapes and carbonate them. So you just tie it up and throw it in your fridge for about six or eight hours. The big idea here, and we haven't met a kid or a mom that doesn't love this stuff. Um, the big idea is with off-the-shelf technology, we can actually scrub CO2 in the atmosphere and eat our way out of global warming. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we do have a television show, we, but what we really get a kick out of is watching the looks on people's faces when we talk about innovations and we've got something to give you. Um, but this does us no good. If you don't follow up on this and you don't keep tabs on what we're doing, and you don't support it, it doesn't matter. We might as well just be talking to ourselves. So in the near future, um, you're going to see some things uh, popping up that are related to the Miracle Berry, and this is going to make strong, positive social change. And if you really want to stand up and say, hey, we want to fight diabetes, we want to you know, give cancer patients what they deserve, we want to make a dent in global famine, here you go. You've experienced it. It's not a gimmick. It's pretty simple. And it's also e pretty easy to see from this presentation that uh, I think you can say chefs in general approach things from a, a different viewpoint. You know, they, they problem solve creatively and they're interested in innovation. Um, so it's not a stretch to say that, you know, when agriculture changes, because it's going to, uh, we've kind of accepted that already. Um, it's most likely going to be responsible chefs, you know, experts in flavor that are going to lead the way in what we eat. Um, and ultimately, I mean, you want guys like us on your side because we like making tasty food just as much as you love eating it. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Peace. <laughs>